Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to AFA Canada's fifth live webinar in the series, The Evolving Indigenous Workplace, Defining a New Normal, where we are sharing our resources and information that can help you navigate through the ever-changing events around COVID-19. If you have any questions during the presentation, please add them to the Q&A window. There will be 15 to 20 minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation as well. There will also be some polling questions throughout the webinar, so please uh, submit your answers uh, to them. It just helps us, you know, sort of uh, have uh, further sort of engagement uh, as we're going along. <clears throat> I'm quite excited about this presentation today. We, uh, you know, as in Indigenous organizations and Indigenous communities, uh, we operate within the history of what has happened uh, to Indigenous people over many, many years, obviously, centuries. But it's, uh, it's important to understand some of these, uh, um, the history and some of these things that have happened, right, to provide that context that we work within. Today, our presentation is called Community Resiliency, Challenges, Strengths, and Courage. As Indigenous communities navigate these unprecedented times and challenges, community resilience, strength, and courage has never been more important. Understanding the roots of Indigenous resiliency, our stories, and strategy helps to guide the decisions we make for our future well-being as communities, organizations, and networks. The webinar will provide you with the opportunity to learn about community resiliencies throughout Indigenous history with an experienced Indigenous business expert with over 20 years of experience in working with, building, and supporting communities. Harmony Red Sky, our presenter, in is Nishnavik, Honestoni, and Ukrainian from the Wasakskin First Nation, currently a DBA candidate at the Paris School of Business. Harmony's research is focused on sustainable management, indigenous business knowledge, and climate change. Harmony holds a master's degree in business at Simon Fraser University with a specialization in Aboriginal leadership and governance. Harmony's education also includes Loyalist College Journalism and Athabasca University Communication. Harmony has been a lead organizer for the Hope in the Darkness Walk for Youth Mental Health since 2018, voted as one of Canada's most influential women in Chatelaine Magazine. Harmony founded Spirit Magazine, produced Four Roots and Rights music compilations and the Sweetgrass Film Festival. Harmony hosted the Sun TV APTN show When the Music Speaks and has reported directly and produced for television, film, radio, and web platforms. Harmony is a mother, to, 19 year old, to a 19-year-old daughter, a stepmother to a 25-year-old, 16-year-old daughter, and a 14-year-old son. Please uh, welcome Harmony Red Sky. Over to you, Harmony. I would like to say good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to join with you all today to uh, celebrate Indigenous Peoples Month, but also to have a conversation about the very important issues that are happening in our country today. So our session, uh, looking at community resiliency, is really going to talk about our history and the links that our history have to our present day, how they've impacted us, and how we've managed to be resilient nations, and how we've managed to survive work through and to continue to thrive as Indigenous communities across the country. So now I will get into uh, sharing the PowerPoint and I'll get into the presentation. Uh, we do want to encourage you all to use the chat and the Q&A box uh, and at the end we will open up the conversation for questions or dialogue. There are also some polling questions that will pop up throughout as well and I'll try to remember to queue uh, those polling questions when we get to them. Okay, so now I'm just going to pop up the PowerPoint. Okay, all right, so I will now get into some of the topics that we're going to cover for this afternoon. Uh, it includes Indigenous Peoples Month and the history about that. Uh, the history of epidemics and Indigenous communities. So we'll do a little bit of a, a focus on COVID-19 and the history of other epidemics that have uh, 
uh, gone through Turtle Island. We will also look at Black and Indigenous allyship and how right now uh, it's at the forefront of, of every conversation, every media story, all of the, uh, the protests and the actions that we're seeing in Canada, but also in the United States. And then we're going to look at where that comes from. And so we'll do a little bit of a conversation around colonial systems and systemic change and some of the tools that we have to work with those uh, systemic changes that need to happen, uh, including the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then we will also touch on some of the revolutionaries and change makers throughout our history that have really set the, the path for us and who have been revolutionary in, in their work and their contributions to uh, Indigenous survival, sovereignty and nationhood and success, uh, as well as we'll look at some of the strategies and what we can do in our communities, in our nations and in our networks. So to just touch on Indigenous Peoples Month, uh, as you may know, uh, it was announced back in 1996. It sounds so long ago now, but I can remember uh, our first one actually and how my community celebrated. Uh, but it, it was announced by the Governor General who declared June 21st as National Aboriginal Day. But that actually dates back to some of the Indigenous advocacy that happened uh, way before that, going back to 1982 with the National Indian Brotherhood, who called for the creation of a Solidarity Day. Following that, when you fast forward about 13 years, there was an event that was held called the Sacred Assembly. It was chaired by Elijah Harper and it called for a national holiday to celebrate the contributions of Indigenous peoples. It was also noted in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and there was a recommendation in there around the designation of a national First Peoples Day. The other thing I wanna acknowledge is that in 2017, uh, the Prime Minister did announce the intention to rename the day, uh, to remove the, the word Aboriginal and to replace it with National Indigenous Peoples Day. So when we look at land acknowledgement, uh, as we do with the beginning of any meeting or ceremony or event that we attend uh, within our community, we typically begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, in this case, since we're probably joining from all over Canada, I'm going to acknowledge uh, the grounds of Turtle Island and the history behind Turtle Island and where that language first came forward was uh, from the Lenape Nation. So there was a Lenape story of the great turtle and it was first recorded by the Europeans back in 1678 to 1680. So the term is not a new one. Uh, it didn't uh, just magically appear you know, 20 to 30 years ago, but it does have a long history uh, in our indigenous nations. Uh, and as you know, territory acknowledgement is a way that we insert an awareness of Indigenous presence and land rights in everyday life. Uh, it can be considered a token gesture when it is used in a non-Indigenous context. Uh, but in our community, we do know that it is cultural protocol and it is custom uh, for us to acknowledge the territory that we're on, whether it's ours or we're visitors in another nation. I also just wanted to point out to this quote uh, by the academic Chelsea Vowell uh, in Beyond Territorial Acknowledgements. Okay, and so to also uh, look at Indigenous Peoples Month, we also wanted to also uh, point out uh, uh, or acknowledge our treaty history and the term uh, treaty people, that we are all treaty people. Uh, as you may know, the term we are all treaty people comes from Sydney Lumsden uh, in the Ipperwash Inquiry report. Uh, that was a result of the killing of Dudley George back in 1995. So it's important to recognize and know uh, that that's where that comes from. Uh, so this slide just looks at some of the history around uh, what the intention was with the treaty relationship, the signing of treaties between Indigenous and 
uh, colonial governments as they were coming to the lands. Uh, over many centuries, these relationships uh, were eroded by colonial and paternalistic policies that were later enacted into laws. And what we're seeing today is a result of some of these uh, failed uh, treaty relationships, but also some of the policies that were put into place as a result that may uh, not have uh, actually come to a full fruition as, as what our intention was in the signing of those treaties. And I just want to also acknowledge that because of language barriers, uh, nations did take the liberty of recording the treaties as they were being written. Not everybody did this, but there are several treaties where this did happen. It was later discovered that many of the treaties were changed afterward and Indigenous peoples have had to rely on their own accounts or their own versions uh, with treaty interpretation. So in modern day negotiations, a lot of the time uh, Indigenous nations have had to refer to their own accounts of what the treaty in fact was. And then below here is just another slide or another quote that looks at uh, another uh, comment from the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples back in 1996. So whose story is it? Uh, and so from this point on, what we're gonna do is start to look at some of the stories that uh, come from across Canada and the US. Uh, but for the most part, the writings from the 1400s onward start the clock with white settlement. Uh, and most of the time, by majority, uh, there is uh, ignoring Indigenous existence, livelihood, and contributions in North America. This also includes the founding of Canada and the United States. So the, the formation of governments, the formation of laws at that point in time. So what are the real truths? Uh, at this point, what I'll do is touch on now the history of epidemics and, uh, and COVID-19. So as you know, uh, uh, it is commonly known that there were a number of diseases that were brought to North America uh, and there's a listing of it here. Uh, it included smallpox, chickenpox, influenza, scarlet fever, and so on. Each brought uh, incredible destruction and sweeping epidemics. So where we were once a uh, continent that had over 400 to 500 million people, uh, diseases it were uh, the most lethal force of termination that uh, did impact Indigenous people. And very much like COVID-19, uh, these uh, diseases were either in a dormant state or were active asymptomatic uh, in some of the transmission of, of those diseases. The first well-documented smallpox epidemic happened in 1518. Uh, at the time, Lakota Indians called the disease the, the running face sickness. Uh, smallpox was legal to many or lethal to many Native Americans. And uh, between 1837 and 1870, at least four different epidemics struck the Plains tribes. Uh, and when they began to learn about the white man's diseases, many avoided contact with them and their goods, thus practicing at that time uh, social distancing. So when we look at social distancing and how it was practiced back then, uh, you can see how some of the strategies and tips and the advice that's been given today are in fact uh, some of the very same methods that we practice in our history. Uh, some of our other health protecting characteristics included our low population density, our mobility on the land and water, or our ability to get around by canoe, by kayak, whatever it was, our seasonal relocation to different harvesting grounds. So if we were at our summer camp in the summer for fishing and then at a winter camp in the winter, uh, our knowledge of the local environment, so our ability to uh, practice our subsistence through uh, the availability of, of a variety of traditional foods, 
but also traditional medicines, uh, how we hunted, fished, and gathered, uh, kept us physically fit. So these were all practices uh, that made us a resilient and strong uh, people. And uh, today, it very much feels like that. Uh, again, when you go to grocery shop, you know, in some communities, we have designated one person in the house is the one that can leave the community to go and get the groceries and come back. Uh, but also, uh, recently, I've heard of many stories of how in some communities, uh, during the Spanish flu, for example, one person was designated then, they would travel out, they would go and get the groceries, they would come back and then they would stay removed from the family and actually practice a quarantine by staying in a tent outside of the, the family homestead uh, for a period of time. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note is that in our history, when a community member uh, fell sick, the family in the community would provide medicines, food, and support, a practice that is common today, uh, just as it was in the past. So I know here in my community, for example, uh, of Wasoxine, uh, this, is, this is happening. So we do have our education and our health programs distributing uh, food supplies to the kids who would normally um, have a lunch or breakfast program at school, uh, but also for those elders or those who are sick in our community as well, there have been extra efforts made to ensure that, that people are being taken care of during this time. So the other issue that we're going to look at today uh, is the issue of uh, Indigenous and Black Lives Matter. Uh, as you all know, uh, it is happening across Canada, it is happening across the US where this dialogue, this conversation and this challenge uh, is, is, is all over. Uh, and so what we're gonna look at uh, is allyship and as well as allyship, our history of allyship and where some of that comes from and how our communities have had roots uh, that go back many uh, uh, centuries together. So here is a quote uh, for what, be, what allyship is or what being an ally is. It's not an identity. It is a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. Allyship is not self-defined. Our work and our efforts must be recognized by the people we seek to ally ourselves with. And so when we look at the uh, issue of Black Lives Matter as Indigenous communities, we know these issues very well because in a majority of the time we experience the very same issues in the very same ways. Uh, when we're dealing with the justice system, when we're looking at incarceration of Indigenous and Black uh, people, uh, when we look at uh, services and how services are accessed. Again, there's many places where uh, we have commonalities. And so our allyship comes from that. Uh, as well, it comes from our history. And so one of the examples that I wanted to share with you today is the history of the Underground Railroad and the Indigenous uh, relationship into the Underground Railroad. You'll see on the slide here there are some of the roads or some of the routes uh, that were were used from the uh, uh, the eastern south right through all of the south and even into the the west uh, into Texas and all of that. So you'll see Louisiana going all the way up uh, into what would be Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. So the Underground Railroad was a network of people and safe houses that helped those that were enslaved in the South to reach freedom. The network was maintained by abolitionists who were committed to human rights and equality. Uh, these groups included Indigenous people and Indigenous communities in the US and in Canada. And one of the uh, pieces of advice or one of the, the messages or, or uh, methods that was shared at that time with freedom seekers was that they were told to follow the drinking gourd. So that's the Big Dipper constellation which points to the North Star to find their way north to Canada. 
So the Underground Railroad helped 30,000 to 40,000 African Americans escape slavery and find sanctuary in Canada, as well as some northern states that abolished slavery. So indigenous communities along the border, uh, including Wapol Island, there's also Sarnia, Kettle, Stony Point, uh, as well as uh, communities around Montreal, all uh, served in some capacity in helping those uh, escape slavery. So here's some uh, stories of some of the Indigenous abolitionists that, that helped. Um, I won't read all of them, so I encourage you to, to look at this slide. Uh, but there's the story of Josiah Henson, who uh, him and his family made their way to Ontario in, in 1830, and they were supported by the Odawa, Potawatomi, and, and Wyandotte, and came through Lake Erie. There's the story of Jermaine Logan, uh, who escaped with uh, another person, John Farney, from Tennessee to Ontario in 1835, and they were aided by the Potawatomi as well. Uh, there is the story of 21 freedom seekers who reached Ontario, uh, and that story was passed down through the Mixabe family uh, and was recorded by Bill Dunlop in the book, The Indians of Hungry Hollow. And then there are many oral uh, 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 stories of uh, the Black Skins village on the Grand River. Uh, so they were uh, fearful that they would be captured by slave catchers. They arranged for 10 Odawa men to accompany them to Ontario where they met Ojibwe people. Uh, and so that was another example. So if you take a moment now on your slide uh, or on the screen, you'll see the first polling question. So if you just want to take a minute to uh, answer this question. So another point that I wanted to also uh, touch on was how we do have shared bloodlines as well. So researchers have suggested that the origin of the RM173 chromosome among uh, Native American uh, nations, particularly the Ojibwe in the Great Lakes region, come from the large number of slaves who settled in the region after or during the Underground Railroad. And so you'll see here are the uh, polling results. Are you aware of the history of Indigenous slavery in Canada? So 35% of you said yes, 38% uh, uh, of you said no, and 27% uh, said somewhat. So when we look at uh, the history of the, uh, colo the of colonization, but we also look uh, forward into today with what we're dealing with now. Uh, one of the things that we uh, have to consider are the colonial systems that are uh, around us, that are uh, uh, in in everything that we do, that affect our lives almost on a daily basis, if not throughout the day. Uh, the they include uh, that Canada's legacy of racist, assimilative, and exclusionary policies and practices have created present-day systemic racism. So the examples that we're seeing of health and wellness checks gone bad, of uh, uh, roadside uh, checks uh, turning to violence, uh, uh, calls that um, don't get answered, uh, that there, there is a need for systemic change. And so one of the, the points that I'll make on this slide is that uh, when colonial systems were implemented and adopted, uh, the Eurocentric worldview uh, was what was considered normal. And in the process of, of making that normal, normalizing European lifestyle, behavior, attitudes, all of that, uh, it othered uh, indigenous peoples, it othered uh, black and racialized groups uh, as well. And because of that othering, uh, 
Uh, it has created limitations to education and career opportunities, uh, unequal economic and health outcomes, facing stereotypes biases that erode dignity and creating a greater likelihood of being targets of hate crimes and violence. So this is something that we're seeing. It is uh, in the news. It is uh, something that most of us, if not all of us, are, are very familiar with. And I just also want to touch on this diagram below that looks at the events and how those events that happen are tied to many, many deeper things uh, in systems, in governments that um, do need to be addressed and do need to change. So if we look at events that happened in the last two weeks, for example, with the shooting of Indigenous women here in Canada, uh, and the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women, you can see that that very much ties into the trend of what we've experienced. The issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women here in Canada, the underlying structures that uh, either create safety or do not create safety mechanisms or protection mechanisms, and then the mental models, so the behaviors, the attitudes behind all of that. So you'll see it goes much deeper than just an event happening itself as a one-off. Uh, it's not a one-off. It does speak to many, many, many deeper uh, layers and issues. And so that's what systemic change is. It's about shifting the situation that maintains the problem. And so here you look at the slide. It, it talks about structural change as well as transformative change. So what we need to do to create systemic change in our colonial systems. And you'll see from the structural side, it includes policies, practices, how resources flow to relationships and connections, power dynamics and mental models. So again, it gets to that, the heart of changing attitude, behavior, thought patterns, uh, and addressing that as well. This slide just looks at privilege and marginalization. Uh, this is actually a self-reflection activity called Circles of Ourselves. Uh, but what I just want to draw your attention to uh, is the chart on the right side that looks at the identities of people who experience privilege versus those who experience marginalization. And you'll see that by far, uh, it's, it's our, our communities, it's indigenous nations that do, uh, as well as black and racialized that do experience marginalization uh, in Canada. So what do we have to do about it? What tools are available? Uh, one of the tools that is available that uh, we can and some of our nations are utilizing uh, are the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was adopted by the Assembly in September 2007. And it uh, had at that time 144 states vote of uh, four uh, and four voted against at that time. It included Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the US. Since that time, Canada has uh, uh, passed and has voted to implement it uh, here in Canada. So what does that mean? Uh, the current government has uh, stated that they would implement the declaration during this, uh, this period, this term uh, in politics uh, for the Liberal Party. Uh, and maybe now is actually the time uh, to do it, though it would mean undoing a lot of the systemic uh, the systemic racism that is experienced. And you'll see the poll has popped up on your screen again with another question. Did you know that the United Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is not legally binding, yes or no? So I'll just add about the, declar oops, about the declaration that uh, it is a universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous peoples of the world, and it elaborates on existing human rights standards and fundamental freedoms as they apply to the specific situation of Indigenous peoples.
Okay, so the results there is that 48% of you do know that it is not legally binding and 52% uh, weren't aware of that. So the, these few slides here, I just wanted to point out uh, of, uh, that are particularly uh, interesting at this point in time, now that we are going through the experience of COVID-19, as well as uh, Indigenous Lives Matter, uh, and the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women is Article 18, which is about the right to participate in decision-making matters. Article 22, which is about the rights and special needs of Indigenous elders, women, youth, children, and persons with disabilities, uh, as well as that states shall take measures in conjunction with Indigenous peoples to ensure that Indigenous women and children enjoy the full protection and guarantees against all forms of violence and discrimination. And Article 24, this was actually the most controversial and debated article in the drafting of the Declaration. Uh, and this is one that they actually um, fought over for uh, many years. And it's because it speaks to the issue of medicines, plants, and minerals. But this, this article looks at uh, the right to practice and the right to use traditional medicines and to maintain health practices and the ability to access all social and health services, which has uh, definitely been an issue during uh, COVID-19. So you'll see there is another polling question here. Do you or your family have knowledge of traditional medicine and how to use it? Yes, no, or somewhat. Okay, so now that we're, we've got the results back for the traditional medicine, you'll see that 26% do have knowledge in their family or themselves personally. 35% said no, and 38% said somewhat. So to me, I think that's a good indication that uh, we are uh, still holding and maintaining our traditional knowledge and uh, around the use of medicines, uh, but also ceremonies in our, our families and our communities. So what I was going to touch on now are the stories of revolutionaries and change makers who did not accept no for an answer. These are people in our history that have strived for our nationhood, who have tried to protect our rights, who have challenged the system, who have risen against uh, systemic oppression and systemic racism, uh, and who have done it uh, to the best of their abilities. And they're such wonderful examples of strength and determination. So this first example is Edith Montour, who was from Six Nations. She was the first First Nations woman to become a registered nurse in Canada. She was also the first uh, Mohawk First World War veteran and the first woman to gain the right to vote in a Canadian federal election. She was also the first Indigenous woman from Canada to serve in the U.S. military. And uh, she uh, actually, uh, at that point in time, if you wanted to gain a higher education, you would lose your status. And so she really worked hard to uh, find a way for, uh, to pursue uh, education. And, and part of that meant uh, going to the US, but also uh, joining uh, the war and, and fighting in World War I. She lived to be 105, uh, and she's recognized as a pioneer in Indigenous health care in Canada. The next example I wanted to touch on is Harold Cardinal. So Harold Cardinal was from Sucker Creek. Uh, he was elected the president of the Indian Association of Alberta, and he was its youngest. He served nine terms uh, in the office, and during that time, was when the federal government released and issued the white paper. Uh, that was through Jean Chrétien, who you'll see in the picture that's uh, here with Harold, as well as uh, uh, the prime minister at that time, Pierre Trudeau. It proposed the elimination of separate legal status for Aboriginal people and called for their assimilation into mainstream Canadian society. The white paper also argued uh, that the federal government should not negotiate treaties with the native peoples because natives or because treaties could only be established 
and signed between sovereign nations. So in response to the white paper, Cardinal helped to draft what is known as the Red Paper or Citizens Plus, and he also wrote two strongly critical statements on Canadian Indian policy, which were called the Unjust Society and the Rebirth of Canada's Indians. Uh, there is also Louis Riel, uh, who was a Métis leader uh, who lived from 1844 to 1885. He was a central figure in the Red River Rebellion and the Northwest Resistances. Uh, he led two popular Métis governments and was central in bringing Manitoba into confederation. Uh, in his career, he was encouraged to enter federal politics, which he did, uh, and I believe he was uh, also possibly the first uh, Indigenous uh, MP at that point in time. Uh, he was re-elected in February 1874, uh, and uh, later on he was actually executed for high treason for his role in the resistance to Canadian encroachment on Métis lands in 1885. So just a, a question here for you all uh, on the on the polling, which is on the screen right now. Did you know that the Manitoba Act contained protections for Métis people and essentially established a Métis province that was never fully realized, yes or no? We'll give you a minute to complete that. Okay, and so 32% of you said yes, 68% of you said no. Okay, so the next one that we're going to touch on is the Indian Group of Seven. Uh, so this was a group of uh, professional, professional Native Indian artists Inc., that's what they called themselves, uh, who uh, formed this collective to further their goals. They included Daphne Ojig, who was from Wakwemakong, Alex Janvier uh, from the West, Jackson Beardy uh, from Northern Ontario, uh, Eddie Kobanis, also from Northern Ontario, Norval Morriso uh, from uh, Manitoba and Ontario, Carl Ray, and Joseph Sanchez. Uh, they were one of the first independent, in, sorry, independently organized self-managed Aboriginal artist collectives and cultural advocacy groups in Canada. And they uh, were united in their determination to advocate for inclusion, recognition, and access uh, to uh, being represented and, and having equity in the uh, contemporary art world. Uh, and they have had a huge influence on contemporary Indigenous arts practice and the art community ever since. Uh, the next one I wanted to touch on is uh, Sandra Lovelace who uh, was Maliseet from Tobique. Uh, she is also the first Indigenous liberal, liberal senator from Atlantic Canada and is a household name for being an Indigenous rights advocate, along with uh, Jeanette Corbier-Lavelle and Mary Two Acts Early. Uh, Sandra Lovelace championed changes to the Indian Act uh, as a result of uh, her own experience growing up on, in her community, moving to the U.S., uh, later marrying a non-Indigenous man, uh, and then later trying to return to her community after having lost her status due to the Indian Act. Uh, when she tried to return to the community, uh, uh, she uh, found resistance when it came to housing, health care, and education for her children. So she ended up taking her case to the United Nations Human Rights Committee in 1981, uh, where she uh, argued about the discriminatory, discriminatory measures in the Indian Act. Uh, the UN ro ruled in her favor. And in 1985, it resulted in amendments to the Indian Act, uh, known as Bill C-31, uh, where uh, women were able to regain their status as well as first generation children. And as you may know, in, in more recent years, the last couple of years, that has also uh, opened up and been expanded to other generations as well. 
the next one that I wanted to touch on is Sheila Watt Cloutier, who in 2005 launched the world's first international legal action on climate change. Uh, she claimed Inuit hunting culture may not survive the loss of sea ice and other changes projected over the coming decades. And her petitions alleged that greenhouse gases have violated Inuit rights as guaranteed by the 1948 American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. So what can we do? Uh, we see the examples that have been uh, put before us uh, throughout our history of those who have risen against uh, the, the systems that have been oppressive, that have fought for uh, systemic change. Uh, and some of the examples that we know of, that we see in practice, are education and truth telling. So that is either individually, uh, in our networks, in our communities, in our organizations, doing that education and that truth telling, being a part of the truth uh, telling of our history, of the realities that we experience, and, and doing our best to be educated as well. So that means us getting educated on uh, some of our history and where, uh, where, what our history is. Another example is building our own institutions. Uh, as you know, in Canada, uh, many of our nations have started to build our own institutions and take control over our own organizations and uh, sectors. And, and some examples would include uh, in some communities, they have their own restorative justice circles or their own court systems or their own legal systems or their own policing systems. This is very much a practice that is growing and building in Canada as well as the US. Uh, and it's important that uh, we take control over and, and it gives us the ability to self-determine uh, for our nations and our communities. Advocating for systemic change. So uh, the changes that are required for Chantal Moore uh, or for Regis Peckett uh, are, are, are changes that require the voices of many. So being a part of that dialogue, being a part of that conversation is something that we all need to participate in when we're advocating for uh, the murdered and missing Indigenous women or uh, racism or uh, institutionalized racism, all of these different issues that we are dealing with right now. It's important for us to be present and to participate in those conversations and to educate uh, and, and keep the conversation going. The other thing that we need to work on and, to, and we need to continue to do is supporting our bright future. So supporting the leadership and activism of our young people. It's the key to our community health, our prosperity, our growth as a nation. Our children, our youth are more than future adults. They are experiencing the world in many different ways than we have with a whole new set of norms and standards that we may not have grown up with. They have observations about the world they live in. They have dreams and aspirations about what they want to bring into being. And we see examples like this in Greta Thunberg, Autumn Peltier, Takea Blaney, and more. As communities, we can support our children's advocacy and activism while keeping them safe by ensuring they learn our histories, our teachings, our languages, and the things they need to know to feel safe and strong. And so with that, uh, I'll say miigwech, niawe, walawon, walaliok, ikosi, thank you. And I guess at this point in time, we'll open it up for any questions or comments that you might want to make. Okay, so here's an opportunity for us to uh, ask any questions at, uh, for, um, for Harmony here. In or comments. People might have stories that they might want to share. Yeah, our comments, it could be too. Um, I guess while people are kind of collecting their thoughts, I'll ask you a question, Harmony. So in the, uh, <clears throat> recently on the news this morning, I woke up and um, I was watching the news and they were speaking about, across the world, they were speaking about the, um, some of these statues, you know, these statues of, of, of individuals that, um, uh, that may have had a role in racism, right? Um, 
and it's all over the world, right? And the pulling down the statues, there's different views on this, right? I mean, certainly one view that I heard was, uh, you know, this idea of, of sort of judging, you know, um, judging the past with today's eyes, right? And then another view I heard was this, this, uh, this view of, of um, you know, these, these are potential, uh, again, sort of uh, reminders, reminders of things that, that happened in the past. What's your, what's your view on this? What's your view given you, you know, you've talked here about um, advocating for systemic change and, um, you know, us being present and so forth. What, what is your view on that? Well, first of all, it's really important to hear from our young people about this conversation uh, because oftentimes we have uh, we have statues or, or uh, paintings or, or pictures of these people in history because we want to remember them and because they've been regarded as great noble people or people who've made significant contributions uh, Again, that is from the Eurocentric perspective that their contributions have been made. So when you look at the reality of what those, those things have been, what they might have done, whether or not they were slave owners or whether or not they uh, imposed smallpox or whatever it might be, it is really a difficult, uh, difficult conversation to have. And so it's really important for young people to be a part of that conversation because uh, there's education that needs to happen. And should they be removed, uh, there's power in the removal of those statues, paintings, or pictures, uh, or, or names uh, from, from places that we see every day. So you can, like, just off the top of my head, I can think of Ryerson University Dundas Street in Toronto, which, you know, as you know, is a huge, huge street. Um, the Washington Redskins, there, there's a number of names, uh, figures in history, schools that uh, have been named after people who have caused significant amounts of destruction to Indigenous communities or have been uh, somehow involved in the enslavement of uh, Black people in America or in Canada. Uh, I do know of some good examples of schools in Southern Ontario, as well as Eastern Ontario, who had names of what might have been a slave owner or what might have been uh, someone who uh, was a destructive uh, uh, toward uh, Native communities, you know, in the early settling of Canada, who've removed the name, who've actually gone through the process with their student body, with their parent networks, to actually change the name of the school from a, uh, uh, the name of uh, whomever it was to an Indigenous name. And so that to me, I think, is an example of the types of leadership that we need to see on that debate. And if you were to actually look at who it is removing the statues, I bet uh, nine times out of 10, it is probably young people that are doing that. So uh, we really need to have that conversation. And it is something that uh, is important uh, for each region or each community to have. And because mo more than likely in the nearby municipality, there are parks, there are highways, there are street names that might might still cause great harm or be hurtful or uh, maybe offensive. Uh, I know in many places in Canada, Colonization Road or Colonization Street is still, you can go into lots of small towns or cities and, and find that road or find that street in that town. Okay. I think we have a, we have a question that kind of appeared here from uh, Dr. Kathy Martin, which is, what are some measures we can take to ensure action is taken on our advocacy? Example, murder, a missing Indigenous women and girls report being put on the back burner. Can we as Indigenous people take a different route and implement any national measures? I mean, that, that goes for the murder and missing Indigenous women's report, and I think also to some degree the TRC. So what, uh, you know, what can we do as Indigenous people to take a different route and implement any national measures? 
So one example that I've come across recently and the work that I've been doing on the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women is the issue of our communities taking, it, uh, taking uh, community safety and protection into their own hands. And some examples of that that have happened in Canada would be the, the Bear Patrol uh, or you'll, you'll see in Winnipeg, in Thunder Bay, in Montreal, and in other places, I think some of them are known as the Wolf Pack or the Bear Clan Patrol, where they've created their own measures, whether it be volunteer or paid efforts to try to create some uh, community safety for their, their membership, for their people. And so that's one example of how we can take matters into our own hands, uh, as well as what at the local level really needs to happen is involvement with the policing. Uh, if it's not Indigenous policing in your community, if it's uh, mainstream policing in a municipality that is servicing you, what is, where is the accountability to the Indigenous community? And so if there is no accountability, what do we do about that? One of the steps are to, uh, and as you've seen in the news lately, but they've talked about defunding, they've talked about dismantling. Uh, what are the other options? Uh, other options could include creating an advocacy body, creating a policing committee, creating that accountable measure that is uh, governed by Indigenous membership. So that's another key uh, important piece as well. Okay. And as a, a last question before we break here, uh, Sandra MacArthur sort of asked a question saying, uh, you know, there seems to be a continued resistance in teaching and sharing our history as First Nations people, right? Uh, how can we continue the impact of knowledge sharing in the school districts, uh, especially in our schools, both elementary and secondary? So this is, you know, this is that whole opt uh, suggestion that, um, you know, a lot of people don't know our history, right? They didn't know what happened. Uh, it's not taught to you, right? So how would you know? So what, what, what's your view on that? Well, I would say definitely uh, the public education piece is the biggest one. Uh, and it can be difficult when we are in remote and rural regions where not a lot of education gets to. Uh, you know, uh, in many places in Canada where there are uh, universities, post-secondary academic institutions, uh, the uh, academic community, which includes many of our young people, have become incredibly educated in how to form allyship, how to, how to have these conversations. And it's something that uh, needs to happen in our communities as well and in these rural places. I think that the efforts that AFOA has made uh, definitely in some of the different courses that you offer through AFOA, AFOA, that conversation is happening, but we also need to create more opportunities. And so that happens, you know, at the local level by creating town halls, having community sit-ins. Uh, a lot of the time it involves uh, bringing many faiths together, so inviting different churches and then church congregations come out. There's different ways to bring uh, different sectors of the population together, and it's important that we do this. And so a lot of the time First Nation uh, management or governance will look at it like, well, it's not our job to do it, or it's, it's not my responsibility to do that education. But a lot of the time there isn't a go-to place or a go-to resource person to do it. So often we do have to look at where is that capacity within our community or within our network or our organization. And sometimes that there might be somebody on staff or in the education department who really is a leader, who has that knowledge, who can facilitate a difficult conversation and, and look at using them as resource people or recommending them out to businesses, municipalities, whomever it might be about the fact that this resource is here within your, your neighborhood or your community or region. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for this presentation, uh, <clears throat> Harmony. So, um, uh, Harmony Red Sky has her own uh, firm called Roots and Rights Media. Um, and thank you very much. For, I want to thank our participants for registering for today's live web webinar as well. The recording and the slides, I know there was a lot of comments on that.
They'll be added to the webinar page on our website, www.afoa.ca. Please fill out the survey, which will appear after the webinar, and please join us for next week's webinar on fraud protection, which is presented by uh, CPA Canada. There's a heightened sort of level of, of uh, fraud occurring uh, throughout Canada, and it's just sort of some, some uh, caution, uh, and CPA Canada has, has uh, agreed to provide that. I would like to mention that APOE Canada is launching its Certified Indigenous Human Resource Professional Program. Uh, the first session will be held July 17th to 19th in a virtual setting. And remember, if you registered for three of our, um, at least three of our, our, our uh, webinars here and, and attended them in, uh, in this series, you're, you're entered to win a prize. So thank you very much to everyone who attended this session and we'll look forward to your attendance next week, same day and time. Bye for now.